The battles of the Philippines make up a chapter of the Second World War that's rarely covered in detail, often overshadowed by more major operations in Europe or at sea. But their significance in the Pacific theater cannot be overstated. Today we're going to dive into how and why the Empire of Japan invaded the Philippines, the fierce local resistance that erupted during the Japanese occupation, and the gargantuan allied effort to liberate the islands near the end of the war. It's a tale of brutal war crimes, intense island and urban warfare, and unmanaged matched Filipino courage and sacrifice to save their home. On December 7, 1941, at 7.48 a.m., air sirens rang out across Pearl Harbor as hundreds of Japanese aircraft suddenly filled the sky, dive-bombing battleships, shredding airfields, and killing thousands, while everyone on the ground scrambled to respond to the surprise attack. We're all familiar with the story. Following the brutal attack, the Axis powers in the United States officially declared war on each other, and the United States of America was yanked into the global conflict that they'd been cautiously avoiding. But Pearl Harbor wasn't the only victim of Japan's preemptive strikes. Following the attack on Hawaii, Japan struck British bases at Hong Kong, US bases in Guam, and mere hours after Pearl Harbor, they began a full-scale invasion of the Philippines. The Philippines had long been in Japan's sights, an American colony at the time, technically the Commonwealth of the Philippines. The island nation's military was under the command of the the newly formed United States Army Forces in the Far East, which had been set up to train the new Philippines Commonwealth units and as a defensive resource against Japan's growing aggression in the Pacific. The Philippines had been promised its independence in the coming years, and the US wanted to make sure that the local army would be able to handle itself. By the time the US joined the war, Japan already controlled much of mainland China, dozens of islands, and even French Indochina, and an eventual war with America for Pacific dominance had already been viewed as inevitable by many. When news of the Pearl Harbor bombing reached the Philippines in the hours after the attack, US officials there debated the next step. They knew that Japan had a lot of forces stationed on the islands of Formosa, modern-day Taiwan, that could be used for an invasion of the Philippines. So the question was, should they attack these forces preemptively? The arguments went back and forth. On the one hand, surely now that war was about to be declared, the Philippines would be a logical next target. But on the other hand, the only movement spotted that day were a few Japanese scout planes who had likely been keeping an eye on the weather. Spoiler alert, they weren't just checking the weather. You knew that. At 5 a.m. on December the 8th, General Douglas MacArthur received a telegram ordering him to initiate Rainbow Five. They previously agreed upon war plan to bomb Formosa now that attack was deemed imminent. After a few hours of planning, it was decided that American bombers could take off just before sunset and after returning, carry out a follow-up raid the next morning. But long before that plan ever came to fruition, Japan made the first move. At 11 a.m., radar picked up waves of incoming aircraft. Squadrons across the islands were ready for takeoff, but somehow the dozens at Clark Field were still on the ground when the bombers arrived. First, a first wave of 27 Nell bombers, then a second wave of 26 Betty bombers, all dropping their explosive payload on bases and runways while the American P-40s and B-17s hopelessly tried to take off. During the initial bombings, only a handful of American planes were able to get airborne, but they were no match for the dozens of Japanese Zeros that were escorting the bombers over the islands. In total, nearly 200 aircraft attacked the islands during their initial air raid, destroying much of the defensive power of the U.S. Far East Air Forces, well as bombing several cities, including the capital. Or Manila. It was a complete catastrophe. Hesitation and miscommunication had crippled what should have been a quick response, and the bombers were even out of range of most of the anti-air guns. No formal investigation took place because the attention was well, mostly focused on Pearl Harbor, and the commanding officers there all blamed each other. One man said, In the Philippines, the personnel of our armed forces, almost without exception, failed to assess accurately the weight, speed, and efficiency of the Japanese Air Force. The attack, of course, everyone on the island off guard. Hundreds of big killed and military infrastructure was in ruin. However, unlike Pearl Harbor, the air raid wasn't the end. That same day, Japanese landing ships stuffed to the brim with ground troops were already arriving from Formosa, the first landing on Bataan and Kamiguan Islands. The next morning, thousands of Japanese soldiers were being dropped off on several beaches of Luzon, the Philippines' largest island, storming up the beaches and overrunning any defenses. Two B-17 bombers that were still combat-ready bombed the landing sites, but did little other than damage the landing ships. As deadly as the battle was already becoming, these first landings were just to establish some beach control and take over some of the minor islands in the north. The main attack began just a few days later, when 43,000 Japanese soldiers and 90 tanks rolled out onto the coastline of Luzon. U.S. submarines were the only naval force in the area and accomplished next to nothing, while a few Australian 
Australian bombers did their best to harass the incoming forces from the sky. The Japanese crushed the initial divisions they encountered, and though a regiment of the Philippine scouts managed to hold their ground for some time, the Imperial forces were simply more experienced and far stronger and in just the first day, they managed to push 10 miles inland. The following day, several thousand more Japanese men were arriving on landing ships, and the situation was already looking dire for the Philippines. On December the 24th, General MacArthur made the call to form defensive positions further south in the province of Bataan. The hope was that by consolidating their forces, the Allies would be able to either defeat the invading force or, at the very least, hold out until reinforcements could arrive. Tens of thousands of troops and refugees flooded into Bataan, while both the army and locals worked around the clock to haul in supplies for the upcoming siege. Japanese reconnaissance quickly picked up on the American plan, and forces were immediately sent to cut off the Bataan Peninsula from the rest of the island. Several days of armored battles ensued, with heavy casualties on both sides, as the Japanese tried to push through the front line into the peninsula, but were unsuccessful successful at first. The Battle of Abdan dragged on week after week, with daily aerial bombings and mortar fire pounding the entire landscape with explosions. Manila was also being bombed extensively despite being declared an open city that wouldn't fight back, and with the ports falling under Japanese control, it was becoming less and less likely that American reinforcements would be able to reach the Philippines at all. With the situation deteriorating, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued an author to MacArthur, commanding him to relocate to Australia. MacArthur and members of the Philippine Commonwealth government boarded a small boat and stealthily made their way through the waters that were infested with Japanese. Japanese patrol ships, managing to evade detection, and eventually they made it to safety. Upon arriving in Australia, he famously proclaimed, I came out of Bataan, and I shall return. Unfortunately, it would be years before he'd get the chance to fulfill his promise. The men still at Bataan were exhausted and starving, but they fought hard. They called themselves the Battling Bastards of Bataan, and though many of them were new recruits, inexperienced, or low on supplies, they were determined to hold back the invaders. But as determined as they were, their chances for success were quickly running out. Disease was running rampant throughout the thousands of soldiers sleeping in the mud every night, and their enemies' attackers were getting bolder. By April 1942, Japan launched a new offensive into Bataan, breaking through the front line and storming the peninsula. The joint U.S.-Filipino army was given the order to retreat to Corregidor Island, but most were killed or captured before they had the chance. The remaining forces at Corregidor fought until the last bullet, but they were no match for the immense army bearing down on them and had surrendered a short time later. Manila was now completely occupied, and the rest of the islands fell soon after. Japan had taken absolute control of the Philippines in just five months, and not a single country was in any position to retaliate. Each side lost around 20,000 men during the operation to combat or disease, but the real loss to the Allies was the sheer number of men taken prisoner. By the end of the fighting, as many as 100,000 American and Philippine soldiers had been captured, and they were about to be subjected to some of the most horrific atrocities committed in the entire war. When talking about the horrors of the Second World War, the concentration camps and other war crimes of Germany often take center stage, but the cruelty inflicted on prisoners of war in Japanese-occupied territory was just as appalling. And the way the 76,000 POWs at Bataan were treated would soon prove no difference. Immediately after their surrender, the men were gathered and forced to march from Bataan to Camp O'Donnell, a path which would end up being 70 miles long, that's 112 kilometers, and they did it all on foot and events which became later known as the Bataan Death March. The prisoners were already sick and wounded from the months of combat, and many simply weren't up to the formidable task. As they trudged along at a pace of 25 miles per day, prisoners were routinely abused by their captors, and anyone who fell behind was simply stabbed with a bayonet or driven over by the rear trucks. Every day, hundreds collapsed on the path, having succumbed to either malnutrition or dysentery from oh, and they drank from the muddy and feces-filled puzzles on the grounds, their only source of water. Anyone who asked for food or drink was shot. One common form of torture was known as sun treatment, where men were forced to sit and burn in the sweltering sun with no clothes and no hat, sometimes in sight of fresh water just to taunt them. Partway through the march, the men reached the San Fernando train station, where they were crammed like sardines into hot, unventilated metal box cars. They were packed so tightly that if anyone died during transit, either from heat or suffocation, they would still remain standing upright until the car was unloaded at the end of the trip. To make matters worse, the temperature that day was a scorching 43 degrees Celsius, that's 110 Fahrenheit. One survivor recounted, They packed us in the cars like sardines, so tight you couldn't sit down. Then they shut the door. If you passed out, you couldn't fall down. If someone had to go to the toilet, you went right there where you were. People died in the railroad cars. After exiting the rail cars, they were forced to march even further, with the death rate even higher, reaching up to a thousand casualties every single day. 
By the time the group reached Camp O'Donnell, more than 18,000 of the prisoners had died and the survivors were all on the brink of death themselves. Most were kept on the island in labor camps, though some were transported to China or mainland Japan to work in mines. But not all Allied soldiers were doomed to hard labor in prison. After the official Japanese victory, the Philippines became home to some of the most intense guerrilla warfare in history, with Filipino and some American soldiers doing everything they could to make full-scale occupation next to impossible. People who escaped the Bataan Death March and other camps met up to form new units since locals joined them in droves. In fact, the Philippines' resistance movement was so large, post-war estimates placed the total number of members at 260,000, running in over 250 separate units. These fierce groups kept the mountains and the jungles from falling into the invaders' hands, and Japan could only completely control portions of islands at a time. They even diverted men from other operations in Southeast Asia to quell the resistance, but to no avail. That generation of Filipinos were determined and capable guerrilla fighters. Entire families joined the many underground groups groups which sabotaged Japanese ships, ambushed convoys, and even stole valuable maps and documents from Japanese officials. One of the most incredible stories is that of a Filipino school teacher, Nies Fernandez, from the city of Tacloban. When Japan first invaded, she tried to keep a low profile, but as time went on, she couldn't stand on the sidelines any longer. She witnessed occupiers torturing locals, either by beating, sexually assaulting them, or even by performing surgery without anesthetic. One of the more common forms of torture was to force a man to drink several liters of water and then jump on his stomach while he was tied to the ground. Not even children were safe, and every day she worried that her students could be taken away to become comfort women to the Japanese army. After joining the revolution, she gathered resistance fighters and taught them how to make grenades, how to move stealthily, and even how to forge homemade shotguns from old gas pipes, gunpowder, and nails. She was reportedly unmatched as a sniper, but her real skill was with a bolo knife. She wore a black dress for concealment and moved barefoot for complete silence. After sneaking up on an unsuspecting target, she would stab him just underneath the earlobe with a perfected technique of twisting the blade, which would result in immediate unconsciousness and therefore no sounds of a struggle. She became the only female guerrilla commander of the resistance and led raid after raid to steal, kill, and burn. One of her more daring adventures was a successful attack south of her town, during which 110 fighters under her command killed more than 200 occupiers. A hefty bounty was put on her head, and though she was wounded once, she was never captured. Another interesting group fighting the Japanese were the ethnic Chinese in the Philippines, who formed a group called the People's Army Against the Japanese. The goal of this communist group was twofold. Firstly, to kill any Japanese person they encountered, and second, to do everything they could to gain power once the war was over. This led to some contention with other resistance groups, and they even fought on occasion along with a group called the Moro Rebels, who were, funnily enough, at war with both the US and Japan, basically just fighting whoever was in charge. But these fringe groups didn't have nearly as much influence as the immense guerrilla groups that the Filipinos had organized. Out of the 48 total provinces in the Philippines, only 12 were ever firmly held under Japanese control, and the rest struggled with the fierce resistance from the mountains and jungles. The guerrillas were determined to do everything that they could to make life hell for the occupiers and to prepare for the promised return of the Allies. When word of the vast guerrilla network eventually made it to US officials, they quickly sent back letters pledging their full support. Submarines crept up to the coast to deliver crucial supplies and exchange letters, and the US began sponsoring specific guerrilla operations to prepare for their return. These included gathering maps, sabotaging depots, and spreading false rumors. One of the guerrillas' greatest contributions to the war effort came in 1944 when resistance fighters in the Central Islands captured 12 high-ranking Japanese officers after their plane crashed into the ocean near the coast. Among the floating wreckage from the plane, local fishermen noticed a sinking leather briefcase and quickly snatched it up. It turned out that one of the officers had intentionally let it sink when he realized he was about to be captured, but those fishermen had foiled his plan. After turning it over to the guerrillas, who turned it over to the Americans by smuggling it on board a submarine, the contents of the briefcase were examined and translated, revealing their secrets. These were the Koga Papers, a series of documents outlining Japanese naval defense strategies, attack operations for the Mariana Islands, and even a plan for a massive final battle to wipe out the American Navy. But crucial to the task at hand was a note that Japanese analysts were suspecting that when the Americans returned to liberate the Philippines, they would begin their attack by first invading the island of Mindanao. And they were completely right about this, by the way. MacArthur was indeed planning to land there. He quickly went back to the drawing board for the invasion plans 
Williams, this time, of course, completely avoiding whatever trap would have been waiting for him there. By mid-1944, the United States had been on a series of victories against Japan, both on land and at sea. The Koga papers that had been recovered from the resistance turned out to be game-changing information, and the United States absolutely obliterated the Japanese in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, an immense battle involving 24 aircraft carriers. The papers had outlined the diversionary tactics that the Japanese would use, and the Americans were completely ready for it. In fact, it was such a lopsided victory that after the battle it was called a turkey shoot. Meanwhile, islands one after another were getting steamrolled by Allied landings, with troops from Australia and New Zealand lending a big hand, liberating occupied territories one archipelago at a time. It was becoming increasingly clear that the tide in the war had turned, and that Japan's chances of victory were now incredibly slim. But still, they fought on, with no signs of stopping, and in turn, the Allies continued their relentless campaign to restore Pacific freedom. In Papua New Guinea, for example, the Allies besieged and isolated pockets of Japanese soldiers as they advanced through the islands, leaving them on their own with no supply lines, a strategy that was extremely time-consuming but quite effective. It allowed the Allies to gain a general control of bigger islands, so that even though there often were still small groups of Japanese soldiers roaming the jungles, they couldn't pose a threat to major operations. So even though the New Guinea campaign technically continued until the end of the war, by August 1944 the islands were considered militarily cleared, with similar results in the Marshall Islands and the Gilbert Islands. Once much of the Central Pacific was back in Allied control, MacArthur began ordering bombing runs in the Philippines to prepare for the full invasion. This included strike groups from aircraft carriers and long-range bombers that took off from the Dutch East Indies, which targeted airfields and supply depots. For one reason or another, the Japanese didn't actually retaliate all that much to these initial bombing runs and rarely even deployed their own fighters. It seemed that they were saving their men and resources to defend against the upcoming Allied landings, and with the invading force they were out to face, the Imperial Japanese soldiers were going to need all the help that they could get. The Allied invasion of the Philippines, nicknamed Operation Musketeer 1, 2, and 3, began on October 20, 1944, when the U.S. 6th Army landed on the eastern coastline of Leyte. While American soldiers stormed the beaches under heavy machine gun fire, naval guns were tirelessly pounding the island defenses, and swarms of aircraft overhead battled for control of the skies. In total, 200,000 men landed to fight in the Battle of Leyte, with another 120,000 supporting from either the sea or the sky, along with thousands of guerrilla fighters that had been waiting for this exact moment. Within just an hour of fighting, the beaches had been secured enough for larger supply ships to drop off heavy weapons and vehicles. Even General MacArthur himself, with the Philippine president by his side, made a historic and rather the dramatic arrival, wading through the water at Red Beach, declaring, People of the Philippines, I have returned. By the grace of Almighty God, our forces stand again on Philippine soil. Throughout the first couple of days, U.S. troops pushed deep into the island, aided by the guerrillas who kept roads clear and provided crucial intelligence. Japanese forces were scattered, low on supplies, and their counterattacks didn't do much more than irritate whatever garrison successfully repelled them. The real trouble was deeper in the inland jungles, where the Japanese were hiding in camouflaged one-man spider holes. From these, they would jump out and place satchel charges on American vehicles, making the dense foliage a dangerous place to drive. These spider holes and other hideouts like pillboxes were cleared out with flamethrowers, allowing tank formations to push through. On October the 23rd, Allied radar detected a large number of incoming Japanese warships off the coast and moved to intercept them. What followed was the Battle of Leyte Gulf, one of the largest naval battles in history, involving two dozen aircraft carriers, hundreds of ships, and over 200,000 personnel. The Imperial Japanese Navy had mustered all of their remaining strength for this battle, but the American and Australian forces outnumbered and outgunned them at every turn. After three days of fighting, it ended in a decisive Allied victory into crippled Japanese Navy, now only a shell of its former power, unable to interfere with the landings in the Philippines. Throughout October and November, U.S. divisions steadily marched westward through Leyte Island, crushing resistance and keeping the Japanese on the run. They even came up with an interesting tactic of firing tank shells from one island onto another, providing cover for troops rushing through the water. By December, almost all of Leyte was under Allied control, all but one port that was now under siege from two sides. The first three-month campaign in Leyte had been decisive, with minimal Allied casualties and heavy enemy losses. But it was only one island in a nation of thousands, and uh, there were still hundreds of thousands of Imperial Japanese troops scattered throughout the cities, mountains, and jungles, each of them ready to fight to the last bullet. 
The next goal of the Allies was to liberate the largest Philippine island, Luzon, the place where the Japanese had first invaded three years earlier and where the capital, Manila, was located. To get some airfields closer to Luzon, MacArthur decided that it was best to first attack the island's Mindoro, and the operation began shortly after. The weather of Mindoro on the 15th of December was ideal, and the advancing troops were covered by both full air support and several offshore warships. The entire island was captured within 48 hours, with any Japanese survivors fleeing into the jungle, and airships were constructed immediately. The Battle of Luzon would be the bloodiest of the entire campaign, with over 500,000 total troops being involved for weeks. The Allies ran deceptive bombing runs on the southern coasts of Luzon, hoping to trick the Japanese into thinking that the attack would come from the south, while in reality, the north was the real target. But General Yamashita, in charge of all Japanese ground forces in the Philippines, saw right through the scheme and built defensive fortifications in the north. The invasion began on the 9th of January 1945, when nearly 100 Allied warships entered the Lingayen Gulf at the northwest of Luzon Island. At 8 a.m., the ships bombarded the coastal defenses for an entire hour, and immediately afterward, the landing ships were hitting the beaches. The only real threat during this phase were the kamikaze pilots, who managed to damage dozens of ships and even sink a few. But the threat of Japanese planes was already minimal thanks to the extensive bombing of their airfields ahead of time, as well as the Allied air cover featuring a Mexican squadron called the Aztec Eagles. The defenses, already smashed beyond a pulp by the naval firepower, were overwhelmed and pushed back. A few days later, the second amphibious landing took place to the southwest of Manila, and it was just as successful as the first. By the end of January, almost all of the Japanese forces had retreated into Manila and destroyed the bridges into the city to prepare for a siege. Throughout the next several weeks, the fighting was so intense that Manila became one of the most devastated capitals of the entire war. Throughout the entire month of February, the streets filled with bodies during the Manila Massacre, a systematic and relentless slaughter of Filipino citizens by the Japanese army. Mass rape, burning, and even using civilians as human shields against the Allies resulted in the deaths of thousands, and executions of suspected guerrillas killed many more. Even a club full of local Germans wasn't safe from the fellow Axis power, and the majority of their children were bayoneted before the women were taken by the army. Hospital schools and churches were filled with blood as the Imperial Army took out their frustration on a people they deemed inferior to themselves. At least 100,000 innocent Filipinos were killed during the Manila Massacre in an indiscriminate act of genocide. As the Allied forces eventually pushed into the city from multiple directions, they first headed for the University of Santo Tomas, which guerrilla fighters had labeled as a prison camp. Indeed, thanks to this knowledge, the Allies arrived and rescued more than 3,000 prisoners of war who were on the brink of death due to starvation, as their Japanese captors fled to one of the main buildings. After exchanging fire, the Japanese negotiated with the Americans, who allowed them to leave unharmed and rejoin their comrades south of Manila in exchange for their hostages. Little did they know, the place they were heading for had already been captured by the Allies, and so when the Japanese approached it, they were shot. Following the complete encirclement of the capital, tank brigades finally began moving into the narrow city streets. Intense shelling, street fighting, and house-to-house -house combat ensued for weeks, and by March, a now devastated Manila was declared free. As many as 240,000 Filipinos died in the fight for Manila, either from the senseless massacre or as collateral damage from the indiscriminate explosives used in combat. The city itself lost nearly all of its historical architecture, cultural sites, museums, and churches, and stands among Berlin and even Warsaw is one of the most utterly destroyed capitals of the Second World War. The fall of Manila marked a key step to completing the liberation of the Philippines, and for the next several months, the Allies went on to recapture each and every island that had been occupied during the war. Despite the obvious Allied victory, the Japanese government and its soldiers refused to surrender, opting to fight on until the last man from the jungle and mountains with whatever equipment they had was done. Even General Yamashita commanded his men from a hideout in the mountains, refusing to give up. For months, the U.S. Army was constantly engaged with Japanese guerrilla fighters. But in August 1945, the unthinkable happened. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were hit with atom bombs, and around the same time, the Soviet Union invaded Japanese-occupied Manchuria. Faced with the prospect of a war against not only the Americans with a new superweapon, but also the Soviets from the north, Japan finally surrendered and ordered its guerrilla fighters to lay down their weapons across the Philippines. The vast majority obeyed the order, but a select few, known as holdouts, refused to believe that their government would ever capitulate. These men went on to live in the jungle and fight the war for years after it ended, believing that the leaflets announcing the end of the war were all American propaganda. They 
chaos and shootouts with the local police, stole from local stores, and lived in makeshift huts. The last of these holdouts in the Philippines, Hiro Onoda, didn't surrender until 1974, when his former commanding officer, who had long since retired and was a bookseller, was finally able to locate him and rescind the old order to never surrender. After spending 29 years in the jungle, he turned in his sword, rifle, and 500 rounds of ammunition at his personal stash of grenades. During his time as a guerrilla fighter, he had killed 30 civilians, mostly local farmers, but the government pardoned him of his crimes. If we add up the number from the initial Japanese invasion, the occupation period, and the Allied campaign, over a million Filipinos were killed during the war. The United States lost at least 100,000 men, and Japan lost an estimated half a million, of which more than 80% was likely due to disease. Just as they were promised before the war, the Philippines were granted their independence following Japan's surrender. On the 4th of July 1946, the U.S. flag was lowered for the last time, replaced by the flag of the independent Philippines. The resilience and fighting spirit of the Filipino people was crucial to saving their country in the end, and they more than earned the famous line from General MacArthur, Give me 10,000 Filipino soldiers, and I will conquer the world.